All right. Hello, all once again. Welcome to the Trailblazers March Fireside Chat. For the newcomers, a quick introduction about the initiative. At the Digital Supply Chain Institute, the Trailblazers vision is to advance and transform future of women leadership in supply chains. And through events like this, we aim to bring forward women leaders to share their success stories and experiences. For this session, we have Laura Bismayer, Global Director, Source to Pay Operations from Corning. Laura, it is a pleasure to have you with us and thank you very much for joining. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Quick notes on housekeeping. Duration of the session is 30 minutes. We will have 20 minutes chat between me and Laura, followed by 10 minutes Q&A. We want this session to be interactive, so we will have activated the chat on Zoom. Please comment on anything you find interesting and please feel free to type your questions. And without further ado, let's get started. Laura, uh, can you give us a brief introduction about Corning, Corning GSM, and your current role? What do you love the most about it? Sure. So Corning, um, for those who may not know, you probably all have devices with some kind of Corning product in it. Um, we are predominantly a, a material conversion company, meaning that most of our businesses take raw materials and convert it to a product that then goes into another product. So we make in our display business, for example, we make the flat glass that's on monitors and um, on uh, uh, laptops and uh, big glass displays that have touch screen capability. We are also, we make Gorilla Glass, which um, many of you will have on your uh, phones, your devices that you speak on every day most likely have Gorilla Glass, or if you have one of the watches, um, that, that probably has Gorilla Glass on it as well. We also make a lot of life science products. We've been in the news a lot lately for pharmaceutical packaging um, as the virus uh, vaccines go out. <clears throat> so we've been involved in that. And then we have catalytic converters that we make in the um, environmental sector working on keeping your vehicles pollutant free or pollutant reduced. Um, and so we have fiber optic cables, another thing that uh, is very hot commodity right now as we continue to move towards 5G networks and everybody has more demand on speed. Uh, so those are all the types of things that Corning does. We are a manufacturing company Predominantly, we manufacture our own products, and uh, we have a large research and development center that is very much the heart of how we create those new solutions that we then put out in the market, life-changing solutions um, that we put out in the market. GSM uh, is Global Supply Management. That's what GSM stands for. The GSM organization reports into Cheryl Capps, who is the senior VP and chief supply chain officer for the corporation. Uh, she reports into a gentleman by the name of Eric Musser, who happens to be our COO, chief operating officer for the company. Um, she is a female, and I know we'll talk more about that as we go along, and she's very much a pioneer in the space, a forward thought leader. And we have about 600 people in our organization in GSM that, that uh, are direct line into Cheryl. But we also have many more business embedded partners who do work for the global supply management organization that happen to be part of the businesses that we serve. That's awesome. Uh, so tell us more about your role. Like, what do you love the most about it? I, I'm sure. Oh, you did ask me, what do I love about my role? I think what I love about my role, so I'm currently the director of source to pay operations and supply mm -hmm. chain digitalization. Mm -hmm. In that role, I also have innovation. Uh, so I was actually recruited out of the innovation organization. I mentioned that our research and development center was really the heart and hub of the corporation. And I, I worked I've been with Corning 25 years, and so my role prior to this role in global supply management was in innovation. And I think what I love about my role is that I was asked to come in and do transformation in this space. And uh, Cheryl had a great vision, 
And so I've been allowed a lot of freedom to bring that transformation about as well as a mm -hmm. lot of support. And so over the last six years, I've really had an impact and changed the space, changed how Corning buys and pays for things in general. And so I love that about a job, right? When I can learn and then apply those learnings to make transition and change for the mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. I just find that so much fun. It's awesome. It's, 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 uh, it's here, you know, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And just curious about just uh, one aspect you mentioned, you mentioned R&D to be the heart and hub, hub of uh, Corning, right? Um, you know, we've heard a lot of executives speak about how pandemic has affected the demand side or the supply side. But I'm just cu uh, curious to hear how the R&D has been affected by the pandemic, how the cycles have changed uh, and how it's affected. Yeah, I think, so for one thing, one year, though it seems very long to all of us who have been living through the pandemic, um, particularly in those areas that have been hard hit, right, um, where we've been through lockdowns, et cetera, uh, one year seems like a really long time, and sometimes our days probably feel really long. Uh, but in the research and development cycle, one year is a blip, right? Many of our products take multiple years to actually develop and progress. And as digital capabilities come into play, um, you start to leverage those capabilities to do faster cycling. Those models and such can continue to run even in a virtual remote work space. Um, so I wouldn't say that it slowed us down. It's allowed us to be creative in different ways. And what I hope is that we take those creative ways that we've learned over the past year to continue to move work forward. And we take that back in when we are all back in the office, all back in the labs. And we take those modeling and those capabilities that we've leveraged and we continue to apply them uh, to continue to move faster. But one year is not a long time in our research and development cycles. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to speak a little bit about uh, gender diversity in supply chain. You mentioned uh, Cheryl Shapps, uh, who's a woman, and she's the one who's leading the GSM. And uh, um, supply chain has historically been a position filled mostly by men. Do you believe that is still the case or is it changing? And what advice do you have for organizations to address this gap and promote women leaderships in, in supply chains? Yeah, so it's interesting is that that really hasn't been my specific experience. I know that when I go out and look at the data, that it's true. Um, but in in the space in which I find myself working, my IT partner who has got a phenomenal supply chain head, Dina Denton, I know that many of you as members have met her as well. Um, you know, she's a, she's a female, very dynamic forward thinker as it pertains to supply chain. We've recently brought in a new uh, IT supply chain focused individual um, that's helping us with the SAP S4 deployments and our transformation in that space in Corning and as another female uh, role. Um, several of our businesses have females in the roles of supply chain. Uh, I belong to Cheryl's organization we're not 50-50 women, but we're pretty close um, in, the, in the higher roles within the organization. Now, when I came into the organization, Cheryl had only been here three years and mm -hmm. we were still more men than women, but over the transition time, over the time that I've been in this role, I've seen a huge transition and I know it's a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. I also see many of my peers in other companies um, being female. I think females bring a particular skill set to supply chain that um, we inherently have the ability, and, and it's a generalization, and I do recognize that, but we inherently have the ability to juggle many balls, right? I mean, I think all through history, we've been raising our raising children and juggling you know, agriculture or you know food gathering and food making, et cetera, and we're always... Um, being asked to juggle many things. And I think as we become more and more predominant in the workforce, we find that that skill set of being able to juggle multiple things at once is a really good 
in the supply chain space. Because in the supply chain, you are thinking about all these different dots that are happening and how they connect and what that That's ecosystem true. looks like. And being able to envision all these different pieces moving all at different paces, but uh, all in parallel and being able to bring them together. I think that that is a skill set, an inherent skill set that our gender has a bit more strength than. So um, it doesn't surprise me to see women being very successful in the supply chain space. And as more women are successful in the supply chain space, I think we'll see more women come into that space. But I've been very fortunate to work in a space where we have a lot of women already in the supply chain space. I think that's a perfect transition into our next question. You know, more women being successful, that pulls more women uh, to be leaders in supply chain. So let's talk about relations. Uh, I think having relationships with other supply chain women, whether it could be colleagues or mentors is useful, maybe even critical to success. How did you go about developing these relations, especially outside of gardening? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I do think you have to be strategic about it. I think you have to think about it. It's about building out your network um, because when you own an area in a company and nobody else in the company owns that same area, if you wanna get ideas, you have to go to other companies that have people who do those type of jobs and get those ideas and share ideas and build on ideas together. That's how you bring better results back into your own organization, into your own company, right? Um, there are definitely women organizations out there. I know there a woman by the name of Beth Morgan has a supply chain organization out there called Boom. Um, it's for women um, and advancing women in the supply chain space. Um, there are, I know other uh, companies that are promoting women in technology and their roles and are helping them advance. She Do is another uh, company that we've had some conversations with in Corning, just talking about uh, women in technology and how do you tap into those uh, women and and build out those networks, right? So the thing is though, uh, and this is a controversial statement, the thing is though, that if you really wanna advance your supply chain career, you've gotta build your network out with the men in the roles as well, right? Of course, yes. Right, and so it's really about building out your supply chain network. And that includes technologies. What are the advancing technologies that touch in the space? You may not be using them, but you should be meeting with them. You should understand the thinkers in those companies, the ones that had the vision for creating that capability, mm -hmm. um, the entrepreneurial spirit that's in that space. You wanna tap into that, right? At the same time, you want to um, align to other big company, in our case, other companies that are like your own company and into roles that are similar to yours to see how they're doing it. I mean, there are several companies that are phenomenal at supply chain. Corning is a manufacturing company. We're still learning. We've got some pockets of excellence, but we're still learning from the Amazons of the world, from the Unilevers of the world. These companies that you see show up in top supply chain articles, it's great to read about them, to understand what their leaders are doing and thinking about, and then think about how that applies to you. Now, Corning is never going to be an Amazon, right? We're not, a, one, we're not a supply chain company. That's what Amazon is. But there are aspects of what Amazon does that we need to translate and bring back into Corning. So having capable uh, network that ties to people who work in Amazon, who tie mm -hmm. to people who are professors in universities, your net, network, in my, from my perspective, this is Laura's opinion, right? It needs to be very diverse. It needs to be global. It needs to be multi-company. It needs to be multi-generational. And it needs to be um, gender agnostic, right? I mean, you need to have both genders in your pool, uh, uh, in your network, and build those relationships. And you need to be ready to help as well as to ask for help. Couldn't agree more, Laura. I think it's very important, especially, you know, you, you, 
you can be confined into your own sector. Just going out there and looking for examples or inspirations from other people, whether it could be supply chain or anything else, I think that's the key. Thanks for sharing that. And by the time you ask um, one of the big consultancies, mm -hmm. the thought is already out there. Somebody's already doing it. So if you really want to get leading edge thinking in your space, you've got to you've got to reach beyond the consult the big consultant companies, right? That's true. Um, so let's talk about a little bit about the projects and the transformation projects, especially uh, you're in charge of at Gardening. In your opinion, what are the key ingredients for scaling and success of these transformation and digitalization projects which you own at Gardening GSM? Yeah, I think that if I had the perfect ingredients, um, <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd be thrilled. I'm still learning in this space um, as we transform. And actually, Digital Supply Chain Institute's been really a fantastic partner in this space. Um, because with uh, the Digital Supply Chain Institute, we've actually put together a scaling program, um, a scaling playbook for our teams to use. And we've talked about all, everything from team size out to the actions that those teams need to work through in order to scale digital. We believe very much in an edge driven, centrally accelerated model in Corning, meaning that uh, people are going to build out those proof of concepts in their space in different places all through the company. I mean, we're a very large company. Um, with 180 plus locations and all over the world. And so you're gonna have different pockets of capability from a digital perspective show up in different places. And what you wanna do is you want those proof of concepts to be proven out and then you wanna bring them in and scale them. And so how do you do that, right? So we're, we're still learning how to do that. Um, and it's it's been great to have uh, DC digital DSCI as a partner in that journey, because um, I don't know that we would have gotten to the same level of playbook uh, without that partnership. And so we are still in the process of finding the right project to use that playbook on, but I am sure that we're going to identify that in the next couple of months. And I look forward to seeing how that plays out. And we look forward to having you back again to share those stories. <laughs> Um, and just curious, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, especially considering your role is focused on transformation, you deal with people resistant to change, right? You know, a lot of naysayers or people who are a little resistant. So how do you deal with them? How do you teach your organization to change faster? Um, yeah, that's, that is a real challenge um, in pockets, mostly when you go across functions. Mm -hmm. uh, or businesses, because you can have a business leader that takes a certain position. And if their position is to move fast, their organization um, or their business will move fast, right? Because you have a top down support and the resistance might show up, um, might be some passive aggressive resistance, uh, but you know, you have top down support. And so you can work through that where I see the biggest challenge for us is when you have two business leaders across two different functions who need to, to work together in a transformation and they have different ideas of what FAST is. So when that is the case, you really have to, you have to break down, and this is where I think an innovation process can work well. If you break down and you iterate, so you go after small wins you also have to think about it as a full field of things that you need to do. And if you can't move one item forward, go and do the other two or three that are over here that you might be able to progress and then come back because you will have learned things over here that you can apply to this space to help you um, convince them or bring change about. In a business, leaders are always um, focused on the, the profit line, right? The P&L. And rightly so, that's why they're in the roles they're in. One of the things that's difficult is transformation doesn't often generate ROI in a very short term. You need a longer term to do that. 
So it, what I found is that if you can break it into smaller pieces and each of those in themselves can bring a return, mm -hmm. that you can then build that chain for them, for that leader to start mm -hmm. um, drinking the Kool-Aid or buying into the idea. And then once you get them bought into the idea, then you get complete support again and you can go back to moving that particular uh, path that you maybe were stuck on while you were working on these over here. Um, so it, it, I will say that it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that's always been in business. It's just our definition of fast and speed has changed. So we have to go back and help everybody redefine. For sure. I think that's a perfect segue into a Q&A. Uh, we have a couple of questions um, which already came in, Laura. And there's Great. a question from Mr. Swapnil Kelkar who says, how should companies, I think you touched upon it slightly, but I thought you could define it more for us. So how should companies define and measure their digital transformation maturity model before adding new tools and systems in their arsenal? Yeah, um, I think this is another thing that, um, given that innovation has been a bit of a hub for Corning, we've always had that dialogue across the innovation process for product and technology as to how do you measure success there? Because you know, to the point when we were talking about the pandemic, one year in the research and development space is a small blip in the time that it actually takes to develop uh, products and technical processes, right? Um, and so uh, when you think about the um, iterative process that you can apply in the space. Again, breaking that down, then you can use more traditional metrics. But again, the Digital Supply Chain Institute, I think it was two years ago, now maybe three, one of the white papers was on the metrics that you need to be talking about with respect to digital transformations. Because in a digital world, you can't use the same measures that you've always used. And in a transformation world, you can't use the same metrics that you always use. So when do we get to the point where we're starting to say enabled revenue and how do we measure that, right? And and then how do we take that transformation and tie it to that enablement of that revenue? Um, and so it, I think every corporation, every business is going to have to work through their finance organization to educate them and think about these things in a different way. The white paper is a great start because it can be shared and then you can facilitate some discussions um, with the finance organization around this thinking. And then again, you're gonna to have to find a couple of quick wins, put those quick wins into play and then um, track them with your new metrics so that you can show how they can deliver. Because uh, the proof is in the details, right? For sure. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning those white papers. So for those of you who are interested, right after this chat, we will be able to send you a link uh, via email to those white papers so that you can take a look. I keep Digital Supply Chain Institute's white papers at hand all the time because the topics are very prevalent and, and uh, timely for the discussions and the educations. And I could do that education myself, but this brings a third party expertise right. to the discussion so that they can get started on their education by reading through the white paper and then having a dialogue and discussion about how it pertains or impacts us in our business. And no, Digital Supply Chain Institute did not ask me to mention those white papers. No, they really are in my arsenal. I'm sure I did. Education. <laughs> well, thanks for the, uh, saying that, Laura. Okay, we have one more question from Diana Soto, uh, who says, what is the challenge you see and face uh, the most when empowering young women in the supply chain industry. What are the challenges you see for them and how are you supporting them from a leadership perspective? Yeah, that's a great question, Diana. Um, so I think the, the biggest challenge is that supply chain involves a broad spectrum of knowledge. And so um, when you're first starting out in your career, it can be hard to touch along all those different points of plan, source, make, deliver. And depending on the companies that you're working with, they can be looking for certain uh, expertise in one of those areas over and above another. And what's important for one company is not always the most important part for another company. And so I think um, 
There's a number of ways of getting those, ex those uh, experiences though. You can get those experiences by having a role in that space. You can also get the, those experiences by having a project that breaches the space in which you need to develop yourself. And so um, I've often times in my career had a job that I had, but then also expanded out and did something beyond the role that I owned. Not full time, and you have to manage it because you always have to perform in the job that you're in, but in encouraging people to learn something about planning, for example. When I came into this role, I didn't know much about planning, so I volunteered to be on the round table for planning. Now, I didn't have a lot of ideas at first, but I was willing to read and learn. And then I was able to provide ideas, but I learned from all the people that were on that team that were very experienced planners, right? So you don't always have the opportunity to have a job in the space, but you can often have the opportunity to, um, to get uh, a project or um, access to or experience with one of the other areas in that supply chain so that you can get that broad end-to-end -end experience that is so important for being able to drive transformation in the space. Perfect. I think we have one quick minute to take one last question, um, uh, Laura. So it, Eva Lamina says, the pandemic did not affect R&D for cardening, but how impactful was it to cardening supply chain and what contingency plans have been put in place to minimize the blow if there is, any, if there is another crisis? Uh, um, a great question, Ava. And I think this has been, um, you know, it's been a journey for Corning. Um, we've got a number of digital tools that are helpful in managing the risk within our supply chains. So the pandemic impacted everybody and, and Corning in particular, it, it, just like it did with um, most companies working through the pandemic from a supply chain perspective. Um, you know, everything from some companies shutting down temporarily, um, other companies, the logistics has been really tremendously impacted. So anybody who's really close to logistics knows that this last year, and, and then with the Soros Canal um, and the uh, Evergreen Boat, that was kind of like the cherry on top of the Sunday, you know, for the poor logistics people. Um, but I think, you know, there are a number of indicators that can impact your supply chain, weather, technology, business, financial, um, viability of the businesses with which you're working, both customers and suppliers, that uh, the, the digital tools that are out there now are helping us manage that. So we have tools in place to, to monitor the risks in our supply chain, to notify the us when there's a potential to those risks. And we're working towards in Corning to get to prescriptive where you actually get actionable actions that are um, shared with you that you can take based on the historical practices of the, of the company and the viability of that uh, supply chain channel. Um, and so being able to put your, to get into modeling and tools that'll help run through multiple scenarios at one time based on the data that you have available to you. And as more and more data becomes available, those scenarios will get better and better. Um, I know we're not at predictive and prescriptive yet in Corning, but I know that there are some companies that are starting to get there. So I see the capability out there and um, I'm excited to see Corning get to that point. So we're still managing, we're managing our supply chains better than we ever have, but we still have rooms for continuous improvement. Awesome. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we're at the top of the hour. That was quick. I wish we had more time, Laura, but it did go thank fast. You. Yeah, that was fast. <laughs> I was worried that we'd be trying to figure out what to talk to each other about, but <laughs> our I audience were nice. Guthrie, that I am happy to have, you know, if anybody has questions or anything that I can continue to answer, they, they're welcome to reach out directly. Uh, to me, um, 
and set up time or reach out through LinkedIn. I'm happy to continue to engage. Maybe we'll share your LinkedIn uh, profile uh, when we send out the um, feedback email, Laura. I think that would be great. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you. So once again, I want to say thank you, uh, Laura, for sharing your knowledge and experiences. I think it was inspiring and informative, and I'm sure our attendees are walking away with the same experience as well. Uh, just to all our attendees, stay tuned. Not only we have great speakers like Laura lined up for you, but we are launching a four-month mentorship program called 21 for 21, uh, where we will be accepting 21 high caliber women who are seeking to advance their career in supply chains. Uh, applications will be open on April 26th. So stay tuned, stay tuned on our socials and see you all next month. And thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much, Sagathri. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.